All right, y'all, I'm going to read some from uh, Romans here, Romans 5, 1 through 11. <clears throat> Therefore, since we have been made right in, in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, God has brought us unto this place of undeserving privilege where we now stand. We, and we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. We can rejoice, too, when we run into problems and trials, for we know that they are, mm, that they help us and de develop endurance, and endurance develops strength of character, and character strengthens our confidence, our confident hope of salvation. And this hope will not lead to disappointment, for we know how dearly God loves us because he has given us the Holy Spirit to fill our hearts with his love. When we are utterly helpless, when we were utterly helpless, Christ came at the right time and died for us sinners. <clears throat> now, most of, now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. But God showed us his great love for us, sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. And since we have been made right in God's sight by the blood of Christ, he will certainly save us from condemnation, from God's condemnation. For since our friendship with God was restored by death, by the death of his son, while we were still his enemies, we will certainly be saved through the life of his son. Now we can rejoice in our wonderful new relationship with God because our God, our Lord Jesus Christ, has made us friends of God. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. You ready to open up God's Word? Ready to learn some things this morning? All right. How many of you grew up in the fire and brimstone days? How many of you remember these days, right? How many of you remember a fire and brimstone sermon? Uh, how many of you know what brimstone is? Anybody know? What is brimstone? It's sulfur. Yeah, it's burning sulfur. That doesn't sound good, and more importantly, it doesn't smell good. That's right. Uh, in fact, one of the most famous fire and brimstone uh, sermons ever was by a guy by the name of Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. So let me ask you this. What was the point of these fire and stone sermons? these fire and brimstone sermons. Not just to scare you. Oh, I'm in church, I can't say it. Yeah, you can. To scare what out of you? Hell out of you. Literally, it's designed to get your attention, to cause you to realize your state. Now, but we don't get a lot of this kind of rhetoric today, do we? We, we, we Praise the Lord, I heard that, yeah. We are much more subtle in our rhetoric today. We ask questions, and, if this, and this is a very popular evangelism explosion question. If you were to die today, how do you end that sentence? Where would you go? Would you go to heaven, or would you go to the other place, Right? So we're more subtle about it, but both this question and these kinds of sermons really have the same intent, right? We're still, we're trying to get someone to, to a place of understanding that if they don't do something, they're going to, their situation's kind of in, in bad shape. And on the one hand, I get it. I understand it. I understand why we, we want to use that kind of focus, but I, I got to tell you, I think the question and the intent here is focused on the wrong thing. Because when I ask you, and I'm not saying it's not effective and you should never use it, I'm saying I think we need to think bigger than this question. Because when I ask you, if you were to die today, where would you go? Is that a positional or a relational question? It's positional. It's asking, where will you end up? 
Well, let me ask you this. Is that the real point of the Christian life? No. Now, might it be effective? Yeah, it might. I remember in high school having a conversation uh, with a girl who was a friend on the phone, and we were having a deeply religious conversation, and it was my intent to, to scare the literal hell out of her. So on the one hand, oh, and by the way, I, I, as far as I know, she doesn't know Jesus today. So how effective was I? Not very. I don't even think she went to the dance with me. <laughs> it's okay. It's all right. Okay, so on the one hand, I think we're kind of asking the wrong question. On the other hand, I think we could use a little more fire and brimstone today. Church has gone, we've gotten kind of soft. Right? We want to make everyone feel good, walk out feeling good. Uh, but I don't think that's God's intent, and I don't think that's the intent. I mean, we want to be real, right? We want to be honest about how life is going. And in our passage this morning, in Romans chapter 5, Paul deals with both sides of this equation, the fire and brimstone side of the equation and the softer side of the equation. So I want you to turn in your Bibles again to Romans chapter 5. And if you're new, by the way, we're going through Romans this year. And you can get one of these copies of Romans in the back and a reading plan. It'll be easy for you to catch up. But here's what I want to tell you. You're going to open up your Bible and it's probably, it could be the New Living. I know a lot of people have ESV or NIV, uh, but I'm not going to read out of any of those this morning. Okay, so I still want you to have your NIV, but I'm going to read out of the Christian Standard Bible this morning. And I'll put it up on the screen so that you can read along with me. Now, the reason is not, now, in, and I, I've had elders call me up, Pastor, did you do that verse because it said what you wanted it to say? And my answer is sometimes, yeah, sometimes that's exactly why. But this morning, the reason I'm doing it through this entire chapter is I think the Christian standard is as I was studying through this, and this is a little bit of a technical passage, although it doesn't look like it on its surface. I think the Christian standard Bible, by and large, gets the wording and the phrasing more accurately correct. And that's not even a phrase, but I just made it up, all right? But before we get into the weeds, we need to start at the very beginning. And pretty much regardless of which version you use, what is the very first word in chapter 5? Therefore. Yeah. So there's, if you ever see the word therefore in Scripture, what must you ask? What is the therefore? Therefore, so I'm going to ask you, what is this therefore, therefore? What is Paul referring to? Yeah, so you always got to go backwards, right? You got to go back and see what is the author trying to connect to. And there's a few ways that we can do that. We can go back to verse 24, 23. We'll go to 23. In all of chapter 4, which Jake unpacked last week, and boy, I got to tell you, he did a fantastic job. Yeah, uh, that may be the, the best sermon on Romans chapter 4 I've ever heard. I think I've heard three, but it was still the best sermon I've ever heard. All right, starting in verse 23, we're talking about Abraham's faith. And he says, Abraham's faith was credited to him, but it was not written for Abraham alone, but also for us. It will be credited to us who believe in him who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So what Paul has been talking about really for the last chap four chapters is our justification by faith. He's been trying to show us and the Gentiles and the Jews that he's writing to in Romans that we are sinful creatures who need to be rescued and saved, but that only happens through the power. There's nothing we can do or say to make that happen. It is only through the work of God that that happens. And he says, look, even Abraham's faith was about looking forward to what Jesus did. And we look backwards in faith to what Jesus did on our behalf. Right? So the whole point is we are saved through our faith in Jesus Christ. We got that? Therefore, what does he say? 
Since we have been justified by faith, okay? So the therefore is about looking back, and now we're going to start to look forward. Since we have been justified by faith, and what Paul is going to do now is explain to us the results of our justification by faith. Now, I picked that word out very carefully. It says, go back one, please. What does it say at the top there? The results of justification by faith. Now, I will tell you, I had a few different words there as I was going through this study, but I think it's important that we get our wording right here. Because we might think these are the benefits. That's one of the words I had, the benefits of our justification through faith. But that's not the right word. Any of you have a job with benefits? Name some of those benefits. Health (laughs) care. For what it's worth, right? What'd you say? Dental, vision, 401k, you got vacation time, right? Those are all things that your work throws into the pot to sweeten the deal, right? To make you happy. To make you want to stay there. Because they know, see deep down, secretly they know you hate your job. And so they're trying to just give you enough to, to keep you there, right? They give you enough vacation that you forget kind of what it was like to be at work until the Sunday night before you got to go back to work, right? So, and, and so what Paul's going to unpack, these are not benefits. They're not things that God's just throwing in to sweeten the pot. They're also not, now this, I did not come up with this, but in this line of thinking, they're also not wages, right? This isn't payment for things, something you've done. That, leave that to your work. These are the outcomes, the results of our justification by faith. God's not throwing them in. God's not g- giving them to you as a result of things that you've done or you're going to do. These are just flat out, this is what happens when we are justified by faith. We just receive these things. We got it in our heads now? All right, so let's go through it. Now, the good news is he's not going to be stingy. He's going to give us seven. So if you're Baptist, you get 2.1 sermons today. Or two and a third, right? 2.3. You get two and a third sermons today because there's seven points and we're going we're gonna to run through them. So the first thing that we get, do you see the first thing? Right up front in verse one. Peace with God. It says, therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, when you think of peace, what do you immediately think of? Calm, serenity, quiet. How many of you could use some peace in your life? How many of you moms could just use two minutes of peace? Just two, right? I mean, you try and go to the bathroom just to get a few minutes, and you see those little fingers under the door, right? Where's mom? But that's not what this word is. That's what comes to mind very often when we think of peace, but that's not what this word is. I want you to think 60s. Peace, peace bro. Right? What does peace, when I, when I say peace in the 60s, what connections are you making now? Right? You're making, you're making a connection to peace and war. In fact, this word in Greek literally means the opposite of war. Which means if we are at peace with God, what does that presume? That we were at one time at war with God. We were his enemies. And I want you to hold on to that for a second. And what Jesus comes and does is mediates a truce between us and God. And thank goodness, because who's going to win that war? God's going to win it. Oh, but pastor, we can't be at war with God God is love. Make love, not war. Where did that come from? Also the 60s, right? And we're going to talk about this dichotomy. Is God the God of love? Yes. Is He also a God of wrath? Yes. 
And what happens, it, Paul is saying to us, what happens is because of our faith in what Jesus Christ has done, he mediates a peace treaty. And when I brought that up to Jake this week, he's like, yeah, but usually in a peace treaty, you all make agreements. No, this is the kind of peace treaty where you are beaten so bad, you just do what the other side says. And we have a fairly modern example of that. At the end of World War II, did Germany get to make any rules in the treaty? Nope. They would say, we would like to keep our guns. And we said, nope. We would like this part of our country. We said, nah, we'll take this part. Russia's going to take that part. We want to keep an eye on you, right? That's the kind of peace treaty we're talking about here. The rules are made by... God. Okay? Oh, that doesn't. I, I thought that was way, way better than I thought, right? All right, that's number one. Number two is in verse two. Anyone see it? Access to what? Oh, man, I took a drink at the wrong time. All right, verse two. We've also obtained access through Him, who's the Him? Through Jesus, by faith, into this grace in which we stand. And we boast in the hope of the glory of God, is verse 2. So the first thing he tells us is we have obtained access through Christ to God. Now I want to tell you, I think we all take access to God for granted. We don't understand what this means for us to have access to God. So let's go Old Testament for a second, okay? You remember when the Israelites left Egypt and they're on their way to Israel? And they stop at a little mountain. Do you remember the name of the mountain? Mount Sinai. And on that mountain, Moses says, God calls Moses up. And so Moses goes up the hill, up the mountain. But God says, he tells all the rest of the Israelites, while Moses is on the mountain with me, while he is in my presence on this mountain, make sure that you do not step even one little toe. Not the one that went to market, not the one that had roast beef, not one of them on this mountain. And if you do, you die. <laughs> okay, so fast forward a little bit so you get all the rules, right? You get the Ten Commandments and God lays out the tabernacle and he says, in the tabernacle is where my presence will be, behind the curtain in the Holy of Holies. But there's a couple rules about the Holy of Holies. What's the number one rule? Yeah, do not go in there. Only one guy, one time a year, gets to go back there, and he better be pure and clean when he does. And if you go back behind the Holy of Holies, what happens to you? You die. See, the Old Testament has this correlation between the presence of God and death. Death. In fact, there are people in the Old Testament who, who felt like they had come near to God and they were like, oh no, I'm going to die. Remember a guy by the name of Uzziah? Right, The Ark of the Covenant was on a cart and the oxen were moving it and the cart kind of wobbled and the Ark starts to, it looks like it's going to fall off. And Uzziah, what does he do? He does the, the right thing. He reaches out to push it back up. Turns out that was the wrong thing. Because God's rule was, don't touch. And what happened to Uzziah? Boom, turned into a blood spatter spot right there. And so now Paul tells us, right, you have all that in your mind. Paul tells us that we have obtained access to this God. In many ways, what should that do? It should terrify us. The fact that we have access to God. Now, how is that all made possible? Yeah, Matthew 27 says this up on the board. Suddenly, the curtain of the sanctuary was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth quaked and the rocks were split. This is the moment that Jesus dies on the cross. The curtain that separates us from the Holy of Holies is torn in two. I would have loved to have been a, to a fly on the wall when a priest saw that happen and thought, I'm a dead man. It is all over. Hebrews tells us how this is all possible. So, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because 
of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. Is that where I left it? Yep. Yeah. And then in Romans, finish it up. In Romans, he tells us we also have obtained access. No, that's not the one. Yeah. Okay. So go back one more. I know where I'm at now. All right. So Hebrews tells us we have access to God through what? Through the blood of Jesus Christ, which by the way, ties back to the tabernacle. Remember when I said that one guy per year could enter into the Holy of Holies? How did he do that? Through a sacrifice of blood. And he would enter in and sprinkle blood onto the Holy of Holies and onto the mercy seat. And Paul has already talked about that mercy seat and said that Jesus Christ is that mercy seat. So we have access. That's one of the benefits, not results, of our justification by faith. But it's not by anything we've done. It's by everything that Jesus did. I've told this story here before, but a few years ago, we had a chaplain from the Denver Broncos that was coming to the church. Greatest periods of my life. And he actually invited me during training camp one year to go lead a chapel service for the Denver Broncos. And he said, you want to do it during training camp because all the rookies uh, come to chaplains, chapel service because they want all the help that they can get. <laughs> so I go in and it was at the Inverness Hotel and he had told me where it was and I'm walking down this hall and I go down these big flight of stairs and there's this big, huge, burly security guy at the end and he looks at me and says, who are you? Now, can you imagine if I'd have stood there and said, well, I'm Pastor David and just started walking? What might have happened? It would not have ended well for me because I was not getting in based on my credentials. I had no credentials. And by the way, that all tends to be situational, right? If I walk into the church and I walk in and I'm here, can I go pretty much anywhere I want to? Yeah. Here's what I actually said. Um, I'm here with, um, oh man, I'm remembering his son's name. Luther, yeah, Luther. I'm here with Luther, the chaplain of the Denver Broncos. He invited me, and the guy was like, oh, okay, go right on ahead. It wasn't my name that got me through. It was Luther's name. And our access to God, we don't get in because of our name or what we've done, but because of Jesus' name and what he's done. In fact, that's how we enter, finish a lot of our prayers, right? In Jesus' name. All right. So that's the second benefit we got. Now, these two results, not benefit, I see, even I, I got to stop it. Even these two results pave the way for the next two. Are you ready? At the end of verse 2, what does it say? And we what? Boast in the hope of the glory of God. Now, if you have a different version, it doesn't say boast, it uses a different word. It says rejoice. This is one of the reasons I chose the Christian standard, because that word rejoice, when we hear rejoice, what do we think of? Yeah, I'm excited, I'm happy. I'm, yeah, it, it, that's not exactly what this Greek word means. It means boast, to have your head held high. We get to boast and, and have a sense. Of, and again, this is a result. Because of what Jesus has done for us, we can boast in the hope of the glory of God. We, we, don't, we don't look forward to a, a, a future without any hope, we look forward to a future with a lot of hope. Amen? See, we're not, we're not looking back. We look back to what Jesus Christ did, and because we look back with hope and faith, we can look forward with hope and faith as well. Your future is not bad. Your future is good. Some of you are like, hey, you don't know what tomorrow holds. Well, that actually brings us to the fourth result. All right, so let's read the next section. And not only that, verse 3, but we also boast about our afflictions. To which you should say, huh? Boast in my afflictions? And by the way, James says something equally stupid. 
James says you can rejoice. You can have joy in your trials and in your suffering. How can we boast in our afflictions? How is that a positive result of our justification by faith? It's His purpose. Jesus died. Yeah, let's, let's play a little game. Let's say, just for argument's sake, you're a sinner. Okay? Just for argument's sake. And let's say you are hopelessly lost in that sin. And now something bad happens in your life. What is the first thought that comes to mind? God's mad at me. This is a result of something I've done. This is a punishment for my sin. And you might be right. Now, let's pretend, just for argument's sake, that you are justified by faith. That the blood of Jesus Christ has made peace between you and God, has granted you access to your heavenly Father, has allowed you to boast in the hope and glory of God, and now when something bad happens in your life, how can you look at it? Is it a punishment for your sin? It might be a consequence, but that's different. It's not a punishment. Do you get the difference, by the way? Right? If, if, if a two-year-old touches a hot stove, what is the consequence? They burn their hand. Is that a punishment? No. So out on the backside might be a punishment. Completely unnecessary in that situation, by the way, because they've learned their lesson. Yeah, you hope. Depends on how smart your kids are, I guess. See, because we we don't need to look at the things that are happening in us and to us as punishment for our sin, but Paul says we can begin to look at them differently, with different eyes. He says, let's go back to the verse. He says, because we know that affliction produces endurance, and endurance produces proven character. And proven character produces hope. And that hope will not disappoint you. All right? So what is Paul really saying here? Can you boil this down? We Oh, say it out loud. We learn from our mistakes and afflictions. We are growing spiritually. So as Christ followers, we can say, the things that are happening in my life are happening to make me more like Christ, to help me grow spiritually. You know what the sad part is? Most Christians don't think that way. We think all the bad things are happening in my life because of the politicians in Washington. Maybe that's true. But even so, it is developing character and hope and endurance in you. Maybe if you allow it, right? And again, all of this is possible because of the next two results. Right here it says, this hope does not disappoint us. Why? Because God's love has been poured out into our hearts through the Holy Spirit which has been given to us. One of the results of our justification by faith is God's love is poured into our hearts. Remember I said God is a God of love? We talked about this earlier, right? But when we have sin in our lives, that love has nowhere to go. But once we are justified by faith, that love of God is poured into us through the Holy Spirit that is given to us. No one in the room is excited by that. That that, that bums me out. (laughs) There you go. And all of this, by the way, was demonstrated. That's the next next part of this, right? Was demonstrated through God's, through Jesus' death. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. By the way, did you notice uh, the terms he uses for us? We are helpless and ungodly. For rarely will someone die for a just person, though for a good person, someone might even dare to die. But God proves His love for us. In that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. How much more then, since we have been justified by His blood, will we be saved through Him from wrath? 
Christ died so that God's love could be poured into our hearts, but there's another part of the equation that is right there at the end. What's it say? Verse 9. We are justified by His blood and we are saved from what? Whose wrath? From God's wrath. We are saved from God's wrath. Remember the question I asked you at the very beginning? You know, if you died today, where would you go? Would you go to heaven or hell? And I said, that's the wrong question. Because we think very often, even as Christians, I think we think our biggest problem is hell. And we want to escape hell. How many of you would say, yeah, I probably thought that at some point in my life. I have. I'm raising my hand. How many of you think, I I think that right now. I feel like the guy at the table says, change my mind. Is hell our biggest problem as human beings? "Ah, It sounds like a trick question. Is hell our biggest problem? No. What's our biggest problem? God is our biggest problem. Yeah, we are. If if I were to ask you this, let's, let's try this a different way. If you were to ask most people, What are you, this whole salvation thing, what are we being saved from? What would most people say? Hell, right? We're being saved from hell. Um, But hell, again, is is like one of those result things. It's the byproduct. It's the consequence. But our real problem is not hell. It's why we would end up going there. What sends us there? What sends us there? Sin does. And what does God do with sin? How does he feel about it? He hates sin. He despises sin. It is rebellion against God. He hates all sin in all forms. Here's the real question. Not where will you go, but what do you do about a God who is dead set against you because of your sin? That's a very different question, isn't it? If you want to be really bold, you want to really shake some people up, ask them, what do you do with the fact that God hates you? Oh, I heard he doesn't hate you. He hates sin. Yeah, and what am I? Therefore, oh, see, we've heard that whole thing, right? God hates the sin but loves the sinner. Is that true? Yes. But that can also lead us to say, then, therefore, God loves us so much that he'll overlook the sin. God will not do that. See, if God loved you more than he hated sin, then he would let it go. Right? Does God love you more than he hates sin? No, he does not. God loves you and he hates sin. Really, it's to say, now, what I would say is, yes, he does love you more than sin. But how do we know that? Because he sent his son to die for you. He said, I can't abide by this sin, and I can't overlook it. My wrath demands I do something. My justice demands that something be done. But my love says I want to to save them. I want to rescue my people. What will I do? See, here's the great thing. We are saved from God's wrath by His love. God is our problem and our solution all wrapped up into one. What do you do with the fact that God is your problem? See, you sinned. You don't have to look to me. You don't have to justify your sin to me. I love you. I know everyone in this room is a despicable sinner. And I love you. And I hope you'll return the favor to this despicable sinner. But God's justice demands something be done and thank the Lord He provides a way. Because He will not overlook the sin. 
Which brings us to the final thing that Paul says. And this is a verse we should have, we should have written down, circled, highlighted. It should be on the walls in our house. Starting in verse 10. For while we were, what? Enemies. Whose enemy? God's enemies. We were reconciled to God through the death of His Son. Then how much more, having been reconciled, will we be saved by His life? And not only that, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received this reconciliation. What is the final result? And this one, you may say, is a benefit of our justification by faith. Reconciliation. Reconciliation. We are reconciled to God. Now, the word reconciliation is very different than a lot of the big words we've been tossing around the last couple months. Words like justification and righteousness. What does reconciliation mean? To make right relationally. Right? If you are at odds with somebody and you are reconciled, that means you are made right. To, whatever was wrong between you has been made right. How are we reconciled with God? And by the way, notice, this is a relational thing, not a positional thing. Nowhere in here is listed one of the results of our justification by faith, the fact that you get to heaven with the golden roads and a mansion. Maybe that's the benefit, right? What is the real solution to our problem? Reconciliation with God. See, again, I think we tend to ask the wrong question because I just asked you, if you ask most people, what are they saved from? They'll tell you hell. What, by the way, what's the right answer now? We're saved from God's wrath, from God himself. But I think the better question is, what are we saved to? What are we saved to? Now, if you're thinking positionally, you would say, I'm rescued from hell so that I can go to heaven. But if you're thinking relationally, I'm saved from God's wrath and I'm saved to an eternal relationship with Him. I get to know God and walk with Him. I think, that, I think we're selling Christianity short when we say the real benefit of Christianity is you get to go to heaven. What makes heaven special? God is there. What makes hell, hell? He's not. That's the difference. But what we really think about is, this is pain, this is not pain. And I don't want pain. I just want to be, I want Mountain Dew and, and McDonald's with no b bad results. <laughs> right? Chick-fil-A forever. <laughs> Chick-fil-A on Sunday! Yeah! See, that would be a benefit, not a result. The result is we get to spend all of eternity with God. That's what we are saved to. So here's what I want you to do today. What do we do with this, right? What do we do with all this? What's the first thing we should do? Yeah, thank God for it. Thank God for this reconciliation, for this peace, for this access to Him, for the fact that we can boast even in our afflictions, that His love is poured out into our lives and we are reconciled with the God that we were enemies with, that He has made a peace treaty with us in love. And we should thank Him for that and not take... Please, we got to stop taking it for granted. And I am as guilty as anybody else. I can read this passage and think, yeah, that's good, but let's get to verse chapter 8. Chapter 8 is where the good stuff is. No, this is where the good stuff is. We are rescued from God and we have access to Him and peace with Him. Let's not take any of it for granted. Let's stand and pray. Father, we thank You for this good and glorious day that You've given us. And we stand as sinners, enemies of God that have been reconciled. Father, does anyone in the, in the room who is not reconciled with you, who does not have peace with you or access to you, 
or the ability to boast in the hope that we have through you and even boast in our afflictions because of the love that you've poured into our hearts, that you've saved us from your wrath because of our sin. Father, you're, you do love us so much, as John 3.16 says, that you sent your Son to die for us. Because while you love us, you hate sin. And sin is a part of who we are. So we are justified by faith and it is your work and we are thankful for that. If there's someone in the room who can't say that, Father, I pray that they will be reconciled to you through the blood and sacrifice, resurrection, and life of Jesus Christ. And that we will find hope today and joy today and excitement today because of everything that you have done in our hearts and in our lives. And all God's people said, Amen.